Today on Blue 58, if you like history, it's hard to find a better person to talk about it with than today's guest. With his help, we are going to try to unravel a little bit more about the history of the team we all love to follow. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. I'm also happy to be welcoming Mark Beach to the show today. Mark is the managing editor of the Players' Tribune. He has previously worked for Sports Illustrated and a few other sports-focused publications. Most notably, though, for our interests, he released a book called The People's Team back in 2019. For my money, it's as close to a comprehensive look at Packers history as we've got so far. Mark dives deep here on the team's origins, its growth, and how players should be appreciated in their historical context. We had a chance to talk with Mark when this book first came out, and I wanted to check in now that it's been out for a while to see what he thinks about the team's development since then. I also wanted to be sure to ask him about the current state of the Packers compared to some previously unsettled times in the team's history, as well as where some of the bigger names on the team right now rank compared to their historical counterparts. But that, of course, is enough for me. You're here to hear from Mark Beach, so let's do it. So it's been about two years now since the People's Team was released. How do you feel about the book now? Anything that you would do differently? Anything you feel that's held up particularly well? Um, well, I feel uh, pretty good about the book. I mean, it's it's um, still still sells uh, on it, you know from what I can tell on Amazon.com, um, and it's uh, it's it's um, a nice thing to have out there. I, I uh, you know I was surprised when I started writing the book that there was no um, really definitive history of the Packers out there. Um, and there was no good biography of Curly Lambeau either. Uh, and so I, I, I set about, um, to sort of like, I wasn't writing a total biography of Lambeau, though that's part of the book. Uh, but I set about to write like the first authoritative definitive history of the Packers. And I feel in, in that regard, it holds up, uh, pretty well. I've, I've, I found, um, mistakes uh, but mostly they're of the um ticky tack kind like you know i i think i transposed their last super bowl of super bowl xlv is super bowl xvl you know it was that kind of thing um what i do differently i, I think um you know i think i uh, give myself more time i was just not a you know either in terms of like how much time i had to write the book i think from the time i i realize that the Packers are about to turn a hundred and the time I, my book was due to my publisher was probably a little bit less than two years. Um, and I would have liked to have had more time to do it because I would have liked to have, I would have liked to have, you know, made a few more trips to green Bay or to Ken. Uh, I would have liked to have talked to a few more people. And, and I sort of, I had a very tight time schedule that I had to fit to and I had a hundred years to do it, doing it. So it was, um, it was a bit, a bit of a, um, a sticky situation that way, but I, you know, I wrote the book I wanted to write. Um, and as, as far as like things holding up particularly well, like I think the whole book is, uh, you know, pretty solid. Um, I did in that sense, I did what I set out to do, but I, the, the relationship between the team and the town that I noticed that like, there's no, like the Packers aren't like the New York Yankees or the, the Montreal Canadians or the Lakers or the Celtics. Like they're, they're completely unique. Uh, not just in the small townness and not just in the in the um, public ownership, but they really are part of the fabric of Green Bay. Like, you know, the the Fox River dividing the town is, you know, the Packers go all the way down in the land and they go all the way back. They were founded by a great grandson of the founder of the city of Green Bay. Um, you know, so they're they're really an essential, integral part of the the, the land and the, and the people there and more so than any other team in any other sport um, that they're really of the place from which they come. And, and that was a, uh, something I learned as I was writing the book. And it has just been reinforced to me more and more as time has gone on. I wanted to circle back to something you opened with there. As someone interested in Packers history, I've kind of come to the same conclusion. There really isn't a good biography of, of Curly Lambeau out there. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why, why do you think no one's ever really nailed the story of Curly Lambeau? Well, I think when people started getting busy writing biographies of Lambeau, he was he was um, he 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 passed away. I think in, uh, in the early '60s. I think it might have been '63. Um, when he was himself, he was only like 60, 
eight or he might have been seventy, uh, but he was he was not a you know. There just had been no nobody had started a biography before then that uh, history that um, had been written about the Packers in the forties uh, by Arch Ward from the Chicago Tribune uh, is a good history, but but Lambo was a primary source for that, and Lambo was a you know I, I think um, you know several people with the Packers have told me that he was somewhat of an exaggerator and a fabricator, and there there are some stories in that book that are just too good to check, and so I think you know that there was um, a certain amount of uh, legend about his life that has been passed down into, into fact that uh, probably isn't so. And I think that, um, you know, nobody got started on it soon enough. Uh, but I, you know, I think that there's, it would be hard to do because there's nobody around from when Curly Lambeau was around and there's the historical record is like basically the Green Bay Press Gazette, which I think is a better archive of Packers history than of Curly Lambeau history. Um, it, it would, it's hard to do. And I found his his, his family was, I, I think he'd been, you know, he's been gone long enough. His family was not um, down to talk to me uh, when, when I made overtures. And so I, I just think um, it's been a, it's been a tough nut for people to crack and they started crack, trying to crack it a little too late. Are you ever tempted as somebody who writes about history uh, when you come across one of those nuggets that is just, like you said, almost too good to check <laughs> to just leave it? too good to check even if that's well, not in the interest of truth yeah it's um it's that's a that's a excellent question i mean it really is it's a historian's dilemma like you have the the great story from the packers um i think when the packers went back into the league and they got kicked out in 21 uh, after their first season in the league and they were back for the 22 season but they spent about eight months in the wilderness there and the legend of the story is Growing up, that I and I can't remember who the guy was. Curly Lambeau's friend was in town, um, but the legend was he sold his car so that Lambeau would have the money to buy the Packers back into the league. And you know, there are several problems with the story. First of all, um, nobody knows how much the Packers paid, or even if they paid to get back into the NFL. Um, you know, and there's no evidence that the guy went with Lambeau to the to the league meetings, or or. Uh, you know, supposedly he he did this all in agreement that he would get to play for the Packers, and there's no evidence that he ever played for the Packers. Um, so there's several problems with the story, but it's all in Arch Ward's history of the Packers because Lambeau told him the story. Um, so, you know, a lot of those stories have been passed down. Um, and Arch Ward's book was very good, uh, but they've been passed down in that book and in other books that aren't so strong and aren't so rigorously researched. And I sort of saw it as my job to correct the record. Um, to try to uh, set things right. Um, and I, I think I felt duty duty bound to do that because the team historian is Cliff Crystal, who's a stickler. <laughs> Cliff's, Cliff's voice was in the back of my head all when I was writing this book because I would I talked to Cliff a lot and I worked with Cliff a lot. Uh, and he's a, a rigorous historian, and a, a, a stickler for the truth and for fact. Um and it made my book better to work with Cliff on it. Um, and, I, you know, you just, I, I, my goal was to write a book that um, did not repeat legends and did not repeat, uh, you know, things that were not true or that had not been fact-checked. Uh, and so it was, again, that was another reason it was difficult to get done in two years. But, but it was also another reason it was difficult to write about the Packers because so much of what has been written about them um, is just not so. And even the Packers 75th anniversary book, um, is is rife with errors. Um, it's 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 really quite astounding that that um, you know there were until Cliff started doing his his work for the Packers on his website on the Packers website Packers dot com there wasn't much of a good historical record for any Packers information. Um, so it's been uh, it's been fun to see my work hold up you know within that regard too because you know. It's not that hard for people to say with, uh, you know, old anecdotes about the Packers, that's not so. Um, and so far, so good, you know, knock on wood. The past six to eight months or so have been pretty tumultuous in Green Bay. So think back to some other times where there's been turmoil in Packers history. What mm -hmm. lessons do you think we can learn as fans from this one? Well, I mean, you know, I would say that this this one was unique in Packers history because, uh, you know, as an off season 
problem because, but, but I, you can't really say that because of the Brett Favre situation. And I, I guess sort of got through this one by just putting my, my head down and waiting for the truth to come out, which wasn't going to happen until Rogers showed up at training camp. Um, you know, I, I, when I talked to Mark Murphy for my book and I asked him why he decided to um, sort of split responsibilities at the top of the organization for football duties but between the coach, the GM, and himself, when the Packers have always worked best, uh, when it's been the GM at the head of everything, whether that GM was Curly Lambeau or Vince Lombardi or Ron Wolf, um, whenever the Packers have a divided uh leadership group, leadership team, uh, things always seem to go to seed. Um, and I, I sort of feel like that's a lesson that can be learned from this one. You know, Murphy, Murphy told me that he felt that things had become siloed. Um, but I mean, silos was what, what Bob Harlan was trying to institute because he's like, I don't know anything about football. You don't want me making football decisions. You need a qualified football guy. And that's why he hired Ron Wolf. Uh, because because before Ron Wolf got there, Lindy and Fani and, and um, Tom Bratz, who was the director of player personnel, and Lindy and Fani was a coach, they had a 50-50 agreement. And any disputes between them, the decision went to Bob Harlan. And Bob Harlan was like, I don't know. You know, I, I want somebody who knows what he's doing in that in that job. And so I, he put Ron Wolf in charge. Um, and I, I really think that's a lesson. I mean, I, I don't know who... Aaron Rodgers is mad at to you. I, is he mad at Brian Gutenkunst or Russ Ball or or Matt LaFleur or Mark Murphy? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. You know, I, I, if if it were the old days, we'd know he was not getting along with Ron Wolf, and things would be a lot simpler for Ron Wolf and for Aaron Rodgers too. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think a great lesson for the Packers is that, you know, yeah, and. Carly Lambeau ran up against this in the, in the late 40s. You know, he butted heads with the executive committee, which was gradually stripping him of his absolute power. Um, and, and things started to go to, to seed for the Packers then. You know, they embarked on a decade of losing in the wilderness. Um, and so I, I just think the Packers are better off when one guy's in charge of everything. Um, and Mark Murphy's a great guy. Uh, and he was terrific to talk to for my book. But I, I think that's the lesson I learned was it. They always have been better when there's been one guy in charge. No matter what their future holds, whether it's Aaron Rodgers playing for somebody else or Devontae Adams going with them or some combination of those things, we know they're great players in Green Bay and they've got a place in Packers history. Where would you put them relative to the other greats at their position? Well, I, you know, let's start with Rodgers. And I want to qualify this by saying that, in my opinion, um, the greatest you know, the most important figure in Packers history, certainly in modern history, is Brett Favre. I mean, this is our 30th, this is the Packers' 30th year, straight year of unbroken Hall of Fame play at the quarterback position. And that all started with Brett Favre. He turned that franchise around, he resurrected it um, at a time when, when the Packers were more abundant. They, they, you know, had spent 20 years mostly losing, um, you know, winning only occasionally. Uh, so I, I qualify that by saying that, but I, I think that Rodgers is probably the best quarterback they've ever had. Um, just so you know, I, I, I love watching. Uh, he seems like a jazz musician a lot of times, like he's just making it up as he goes along. Um, although I think Matt LaFleur did a great job of getting him to, you know, not improvise quite as much last year. Um, uh, I thought that was a really uh, key thing to the way Rodgers season turned around, but it, you know, there was, I think Rogers is the best quarterback they've ever had. Um, Devontae Adams, it's harder to say because, you know, there's a great tradition of, of quarterbacks in green Bay or passers in green Bay going all the way back to Arnie Herbert um, in the, in the early thirties. Um, there is almost as great a tradition of, of receivers in green Bay going back to Johnny blood in the early thirties um, for Devontae Adams to fit into. And I'm, I think he probably ranks close up there. I mean, Sterling Sharp, who knows where that guy would be. Um, he was one of the best ever. Uh, but you, Don Hudson, Sterling Sharp, I, I think Devontae Adams is easily top five, top three probably. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, I, I think his greatness is, you know, last year we began finding out 
how great he could actually be after he was already, he'd already been great for two years before that, but, but last year he was something else. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see what happens this year. He's, he's just a wonderful player. So those are some of the big names. I mean, present yep. names, Rogers and, and Adams are about as big as it gets, but you can look through Packers history and, and come across a lot of big names and, you know, you can put together, you could put together a great history of the team by just looking at the hall of fame caliber players, but there's yep. a lot of guys that have been great, uh, that have not made the hall of fame that have not you know, gotten big headlines. Can you give me an example of a player you think doesn't get proper historical credit? Well, I mean, I, I've got to start this by saying that I'm just a huge champion for Leroy Butler to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, the fact that John Lynch went in first, uh, I just think is insulting to Leroy Butler. And, you know, I think Leroy was drafted by Tom Bratz and Lindy and Fani, and both those guys have passed away. There's nobody to champion Leroy's case for the Hall of Fame except players. And I think Favre needs to do a better job of that. I think, you know, Reggie White would be the other choice, but Reggie's going too. Um, so I'll, the, with the Roy Butler caveat out of the way, uh, I would say that Vern Llewellyn is probably the player that's been most overlooked uh, in Packers history for the Hall of Fame. Vern Llewellyn was a halfback uh, in the 20s. Um, from 1920 to 31, the NFL's pre-stats era, no player in the NFL scored more touchdowns than Vern Llewellyn. Um, you know, he was also a leading passer and a leading receiver and a leading rusher uh, in the years he played, I think, which was 24 to 31. Um, on the Packers' three straight championship teams, 1929 to 1931, he was certainly the best player on their team the first two seasons and probably the third. Um, both Johnny Blood and and Charlie Mathis, who were guys who played with him, said it was an absolute joke that he wasn't in the Hall of Fame. Johnny Blood was a first first ballot, first time debut NFL Hall of Famer when the NFL Hall of Fame was created. Um, he said Llewellyn should have been in when he went in. Um, nobody scored more TDs than Llewellyn. I, you know, the, the NFL teams averaged fewer than 10 points a game in, in the pre-stats era. Uh, nobody scored more touchdowns than Llewellyn. I think that's very significant. He was also a tremendous punter. Back when teams, if they had the ball deep in their own territory, uh, they would punt right away. Uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't uncommon to see a team punt on first or second down uh, to get the ball out of bad field position uh, because the ball was rounder and it rolled. Uh, and, you know, um, teams always talked about Llewellyn's punting or uh, out-of-town papers always talked about Llewellyn's punting. Uh, being such a great weapon, uh, you know, pro pro football was called paid punting back in the 20s. Uh, and there was no better paid punter than Vern Llewellyn, who probably before Sammy Ball was the first great punter in the history of the NFL. Um, he was, you know, in 48, uh, Lambeau had to choose an all time team. Uh, he chose Vern Llewellyn and Cecil, Cecil Isabel as his two halfbacks. Um, I think that's very telling. Um, you know, the halfback was a primary passer and, and um, maker of, make, you know, he made the offense go in, in Lambeau's day and nobody did that better than Vern Llewellyn. So he's my, he's my um, hobby horse. When people ask me what Packers should be in the Hall of Fame, who isn't, after I tell them Leroy Butler definitely belongs there now, uh, Vern Llewellyn belonged there a long time ago and he, he should go in soon. It's a, it's a joke that he's not there. So kind of related to historical credit, Pro Football Reference and a couple other related outlets made a decision this offseason to start listing, at least in context, guys from the pre-official stat era, uh, their sack totals, their career stat, uh, sack totals. Uh, yeah. What did you think of that move? Do you think that's a good move? Is that Are those numbers that we can rely on, in, in your opinion, from what you've looked at? Um, I, How far back do they go with that? They go back. They went back to like the... The modern era, right? The 60s? Yeah, I think they go back to 1960. So it's about a 24-year window or so. I, I feel like they're covering themselves well in the history there because, you know, the, the stats on those games exist. Uh, film on those games exist. Uh, the counting might be difficult uh, in some of the earlier games. But, like, as you get further into the late 60s and early 70s, I think it's, you know, they're, they can definitely tell. Um, I feel like those are pretty good, and I, I was – it was no surprise to me to see Willie Davis so high up on that list. Um, you know, the guy, the guy needed a lot. He, he was robbed by not playing in the, in the sacks era. Um, he just, you know, I think in, 
Super Bowl two, I counted like three. He had three and a half sacks of Daryl LaMonica. I mean, he was just a, a physical force on the defensive line, um, a great player. And uh, I was glad to see him get his due. I, I think you can trust those um, those numbers, you know, with a grain of salt. But I think you can, I think pro football reference, I know a lot of the, you know, I know a couple of the guys who worked on that um, or work on that. And I think they do a good job. So the Packers are, or Packers fans, I guess, are pretty blessed in, in having 100 plus now years of history to study. But and feel free to get as philosophical with this one as you want, but why should somebody study the history of the Packers? Why should you make the effort? Well, I think, um, I mean, if you're a fan of the team, I think it's worthwhile to, to see just how deep the connection between the team and the town goes. Um, you know, that you, I think um, you asked me earlier about um, times of uncertainty and turmoil, and like for the first 50 years of their existence or so the Packers were always always on their deathbed they were always on the brink of extinction um, and they were kept alive by the businessmen in the town um, who thought it was a good thing for Green Bay Green, they went out on their travels and they saw that Green Bay was known for having this football team and they saw the value in uh, you know having a franchise and having an NFL team and in what was even in the 20s the smallest town in the NFL uh, Green Bay, except for a few you know years in the 20s, has always been the smallest town in the NFL, um, by far. Uh, so I, you know, I think, I think in that way it's valuable. You you learn about the connection between the team and the town. Um, I also think like, um, you know, no team is really even close to the Packers' number of NFL championships. The Packers have won 13. Um, including three before there were championship games. So they've won 10 championships when there were championship games, which is still more than any team in the NFL. The, the closest, you know, pursuer to Green Bay in terms of championships has won nine. I think it's the Bears. Um, so the, 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 it's the most storied team in the NFL. You know, you, Title Town is a, is a great moniker. Uh, it was conceived in the 60s, by the way, before the Packers played the I think it was a 61 championship game in uh, in Green Bay, which was the first championship game in Green Bay, actually, of any kind. Um, and, uh, you know, it was really a, a great name, and it stuck for obvious reasons, um, especially after they did what they did in the 60s. But you know, lots of other places want to be Titletown. New York would like to be Titletown. Boston would like to be Titletown. Uh, you know, um, L.A. would like to be Titletown. But they can't be. It's it's in one place. It's in one little place in Wisconsin, one little miraculous place. I mean, the Packers, the story of the Packers is really Cliff, Cliff Crystal calls it the best story in sports. And he's not wrong. Um, it's a miracle this team still exists in so many ways. And I, I think um, you get a greater appreciation for what the Packers are now, which is, you know, their relationship to the town is completely different than it was for most of their history, like the Packers are Green Bay in a lot of ways now, um, but before they weren't. And it's it's really a wonderful, a wonderful thing. And I, I think to, you know, to, to understand that about the team is just um, makes being a fan of the team so much more enriching. So if that sparks your curiosity, if you're somebody listening to this and you want to get started, where would you, Mark, say that someone should do that? Where should you start diving deeper into Packers history? How do you do that? How do you get get it going? Well, where I started was, um, I mean, you could read my book now, <laughs> but where I started was, uh, I, I was reading Cliff Crystal, Cliff Crystal's uh, column on the Packers website on Packers.com. Uh, and, he, you know, you can, re you can tell right away that Cliff is doing work that's different than uh, any other historian in pro football. I found uh, Cliff to be more reliable as a resource than the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And because Cliff is so heavily invested in the Packers and so heavily involved, I mean, there's no other team in the NFL with its own historian, officially. Um, and the other historians for teams are not, I'm, I'm telling you that, you know, from the bottom of my soul, Cliff is different than every other historian for every other team out there. Um, and so starting with his stuff on the website is uh, essential. If you want a good history of the team, a good pocket history of the team, 
Um, you can buy the Packers Media Guide in the Pro Shop or online. Uh, Cliff is responsible for a lot of the history that's in there. And he's a lot, he's responsible for correcting a lot of errors that weren't in there before. Uh, and Cliff is also involved in the Packers uh, Hall of Fame, um, which is a wonderful visit. Uh, the, the Packers have done a lot since the days of Bob Harlan and the re renovation of Lambeau Field to turn Lambeau into a year-round destination, um, a place you can go not just for games on Sundays in the fall. Uh, and the, the, having the Hall of Fame there is, is a great is a great thing. There's wonderful stuff there. The Neville Museum in Green Bay is terrific. Um, there's lots of stuff about Green Bay, like the story of the Fox River and the story of the building of Green Bay is in a lot of ways contributed to the, the, the existence of the Packers, like the rivalry that, that grew up between the east and west sides of town um, gave birth to the rivalry between Green Bay East and Green Bay West high schools, which directly gave birth to the Packers. Um, you know, and it caused football, you know, Green Bay East, Green Bay West was a bigger game in town than Packers Bears for a long time, you know, at least through the 20s. Um, so, the, you know, going to Green Bay and seeing the Neville and seeing the Packers Hall of Fame uh, is terrific. If you're remote, uh, Cliff's stuff on the website, the Packers Media Guide is great. Cliff wrote a great companion piece to the Heritage Trail. That, that's another thing. John, I didn't even think of it. The Packers have a Heritage Trail. What other town in America besides Boston has a trail that traces history through to town? Like, I, I can't think of one. You know, Boston is the Freedom Trail, which traces the history of America. Uh, the Packers, the Packers Heritage Trail traces the history of the NFL team and, and shows all the places in which it like, you know, started and began and where it's still relevant. It's it's really an amazing thing. It's it's so rewarding, the history of the Packers um, to it, to somebody who's a student of the team, but also a student of the game. Uh, I think that, you know, all those places are good places to start. And it's a, it's a rewarding it will reward you in many ways along the way. Mark, I appreciate your time. I want to give people an opportunity to connect with you and your work and what you're doing today. For, first, I guess, what are you working on now? Uh, what should we be looking for and, and where can we find you? Um, well, I'm the managing editor of Players Tribune, um, the Players Tribune, which is playerstribune.com, um, which is the website started by Derek Jeter and after he retired in 2014 that the, the allowed athletes to tell their own stories in their own way. And so you go there and you can read pieces by Derek Jeter or, or, or Alan Iverson or, um, you know, um, Romelu Lukaku, uh, uh, who just uh, transferred to Chelsea um, in the English Premier League. Um, and you read stories by those guys. It's terrific and it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's, a, it's a different spin on the sports journalism I did for a long time at Sports Illustrated. Um, I'm working on another book project now. I, I don't want to say what it is yet because it's not quite there, not quite the, the the chestnut is not quite roasted all the way, but, um, you know, football history is still in my, um, in my sights. And I, I think there's some other good stories to tell. A big thanks to Mark Beach for appearing on today's show. I've included links for where you can connect with him and his work, as well as by the people's team with today's podcast. That's going to do it for today's show. I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate you tuning in for every episode. If you enjoyed this one and think somebody, you know, might enjoy it as well. It'd mean a lot to me if you would go ahead and share it. It's going to help more people find the show and, of course, get more people involved in this conversation we're having around the Green Bay Packers. And getting more people involved is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And that's great because, as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.